truths of past, penetrating the perfect truth, the self we met with, even in a hundred thousand myriad helpless. Now we can see and hear it. We can remember and accept it. I vow to make the Buddha's truth one with myself. Homage to Buddha, homage to the Dharma, homage to the Sangha. I hope to see you all again. I'll be back with us. Today, uh, we commemorated the Buddha's renunciation. He left his wife and child and home in his father's palace to search for the truth for himself for his family, for all beings, and to find the cause of suffering. So we can ask ourselves now, here we all are, what does this have to do with us? The word renunciation, I think, often strikes fear in people's hearts because it conjures up images of us trying to, to let go of everything, leave everything that we find precious and dear. And uh, who knows, you don't have to be coming off. So uh, what I want to talk about today is how we can make use of what lies within the heart of this teaching for the benefit of ourselves and others in whatever circumstances we find ourselves in. We can think of this, we can think of renunciation in terms of giving up the craving for that which is extra and living simply, living simply with contentment. As we meditate and quiet down, we get more and more with what, uh, more and more in touch with uh, what is really necessary and we can more easily distinguish between that between what we want uh, and what we need. I can remember when I would come to retreats uh, as lay training, when I would come up here to the Abbey, for the end of every retreat, I would start to mentally start cleaning up my closets at home. Starting to do house cleaning, physical and spiritual house cleaning. It never failed. I do it during meditation, I'm sorry to say. But there was a sense really of eagerness of letting go of things I didn't need. And carrying things down, dealing with both physical and spiritual clutter in an effort to see more clearly. And there was always the joy and the lightness about it. I'd like to say that, um, you know, I was able to maintain the practice of, of simplicity, but of course the desire to uh, collect and, um, and to add, the desire to add and uh, to bring in, to bring in something. Rev. Anderson talked about this. He's a disciple of Suzuki Roshi. He talks about this in his chapter on um, intoxicants, precept against intoxicants, delusion, selling one delusion, the necessity, the feeling of the necessity to bring something in to whatever situation that we're in. I don't know what it is about that, but that image is just really powerful for me. I'm going to come back to it after a bit. But, um, so I think we need to have some compassion for ourselves that, uh, about the way that we have been brought up and educated in our society. We recognize that it's a consumer society and that we have been um, actually taught how to do this very well since an early age. And there's a lovely book here called, um, called Hook. And what it is is Buddhist writings on greed, desire, and the urge to consume. And it's really quite interesting because the, um, it talks about some of the ways 
which are subtle, some of them, and some of them not so subtle, that consumerism affects our spiritual life and our environment, certainly. So how can we tell the difference between what we need and what we want? This, um, this is a, a paragraph from the book, Hooked, and it, it, uh, it summarizes something that we already know. I think that it's a good starting place. An underlying assumption of the dominant mode of life in today's consumer society is that you are what you have. Um, this mode of life drives us in the, in the direction of wanting more and more, believing that having more is the key to success. However, sooner or later, we realize that the more we have, the more we still want. And thus, we realize that we can never really be satisfied with what we already have. In short, this desire keeps us in a constant state of dissatisfaction. I can remember back in the 1750s, what the 50s we called it, keeping up with the Joneses. We were on to it even then, but I'm not sure we knew what to do about it. And then uh, later on, uh, the Rolling Stones wrote a song, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. So in fact, this the next generation attempt to deal with it. So the question is, what does the Dharma have to say about, about the constant craving and dissatisfaction? Um, I was talking with some member in December, uh, someone who has been working in ecology and the environment for many years, and I was expressing my ongoing concern about the grave state of the environment on our planet, and what are the Buddhist teachings that address the issue and can be put into practice. Um, I mean, actually, when we get right down to it, all of the Buddhist teachings address these issues. Uh, but what she said is, I'd like to hear a talk on simple living. And I would add, simple living with joy. Because Reverend Master Jiu brought to light for us the teachings of our tradition, which give a blueprint for how to do it. And um, I'm going to come back to that a little bit later, but I want to talk a little bit more uh, about just the, the, uh, the concept of renunciation. So last month, while we were closed, I had an opportunity to do some reading and reflection. And wouldn't you know, I just happened to pick up this book called Unexpected Freedom by one of Ajahn Chah's disciples, Ajahn Menendo. Ajahn Chah was a Theravada master, uh, master of the forest tradition. And this is his disciples' uh, chapter on the renunciation. And what he starts out by saying, renunciation is one of what are known as the ten paramitas, the perfections, or forces of goodness. I have something about that I think is quite wonderful. It's a force of goodness. Um, he says, um, I, along with many others, choose to live this life because of the understanding that there is tremendous benefit in being able to give up that which is extra, to let go of that which is not necessary, and to live a simple life. He says the reality is if we don't know how to say no to our conditioned desires, we're easily calmed by the outer world and by our inner drives. If you can't say no to yourself when you go to one of these supermarkets that have everything, you're likely to purchase more than you intend. Leaping through exciting catalogs or shopping on the web, you can be turning over your credit card details, acting out according to the drama of the marketplace, and only afterwards start thinking, what did I do that for? We're all familiar with something like this. The inability 
to say no to things that are extra. And then he goes on to say that, you know, we can recognize this on the external level when we buy things that we don't need, uh, CDs that we never listen to, food that we aren't interested in eating. But what is more difficult to see is how this pattern pertains to our inner world. To see the mental compulsion of perpetually adding on to experience. Good, bad, right, wrong, should, shouldn't. This tendency to react, judge, and add on to our experience prevents us from being able to see, perceive reality in a pure, undiluted form. The point of living a life where one renounces certain options is that by cultivating a conscious willingness to say no to things that we might otherwise want to have or do, things that are not necessarily necessary to our well-being, we use outer conventions to learn how to let go at a deeper level. So, um, I get rid of extra mental baggage. Now then he goes on to tell this story, this is one of my favorite stories. He says, um, I recall Trans, because he said the point here is you have to actually practice renunciation. You have to get clear about what it is and then practice it. And he tells a story, he says, I can recall translating for a newly ordained young monk, this would have been in Thailand, who was full of the inspiration that has come from recently being received into the renunciate sangha. He was asking Ajahn Chah for advice on how to apply the various methods for cultivating renunciation and determination. This bright-eyed and energetic young fellow was telling Ajahn Chah how he wanted to make a determination to spend the following three months of the rains retreat observing the practices of not lying down to sleep, not, not accepting food other than that gathered on the alms ground, eating only one meal a day, wearing only the bare minimum of clothes, and so on. He listed these Dutonga practices, yes, all these ascetic practices that he wanted to do. And Ajahn Chah listened, and then he simply com commented that the best thing would be if he just determined to keep practicing for the three months, whatever happened. <laughs> You know, this reminded me so much of Reverend Master G, who used to say, you know, once in a while you get to make a great gesture, but the real practice is just keeping your foot on the, on the gas pedal 55 miles an hour and going to speed limit, not doing, not bringing anything in, you could say. You know, just staying to that practice. And, um, anyway, nothing special. So, because the point is that renunciation is rooted in adequacy. In the most fundamental of the Buddhist teachings, you know, our morning scriptures say, preserve well for you now have, that is all. So, renunciation helps us to get in touch with that which is not extra, that which is our real nature, really to get in touch with our hearts, to get in touch with our real nature. We don't need to change our circumstances. We don't need to uh, abandon our families or um, give up uh, those things which um, we feel are the most important to us, we can simply look at our situation with fresh eyes, at our belongings, at our surroundings, and change our relationship to them. That is where the uh, renunciation comes in. And um, so, where do we start? How do we know what's extra? In the midst of the constant uh, stimulation coming in at us uh, in this 
age of technology. You know, we could think she was probably easier in the Buddhist time. We didn't have, we didn't have um, the internet. I don't think I've been sitting under the Bodhi tree emailing or, you know, going online, <laughs> being constantly beset with all kinds of um, simulation. And yet, of course, when he was sitting under the Bodhi tree, the hordes of Mara turned up, and he had his own temptations to deal with. So, looking at, you know, this is, this is a, the, uh, what, what are, what is our own version of our hordes of Mara coming at us? What is extra? What are we bringing in that we don't need? So, I think we can start by just dropping anchor, you know, in the middle of all the stimulation and looking at what's right in front of us. I always come back to this teaching that I learned when I came to an introductory retreat here in one of the Master Masterjews. Basic teachings put your shoes straight. When you come to an introductory retreat, you are taught to put your shoes straight. And the reason that we do that is both out of compassion for the others who uh, also have their shoes there, and also giving care and attention to our shoes. We don't want to create a situation where shoes are all over the place and people can trip over them. And when we really start taking the time and effort to put our shoes straight, we start really noticing what they are doing for us. They're keeping our feet warm. They are protecting us from uh, rocks and stones. Um, they are allowing us to walk with ease. And uh, it doesn't really matter if they are fancy or if they're run down at the heels. Um, they are offering us this no matter what shape they are in. They are doing, they're doing their job with shoes. That is the essence of shoe. And um, her master Hugh used to talk about this in terms of being able to see their Buddha nature. Um, she has she had a lovely uh, I remember talking about this in one of the uh, lectures that she was giving down at UC, I think it was in the student union there. We were doing a retreat there in the student union, and um, she's talking about the road, the road outside. If any of you have been down to the UC campus, you know Telegraph Avenue goes right up to the uh, plaza there. And the student union was right on the plaza. I used to walk that. I, I don't know how many times I walked that road because I went to UC. Uh, that's uh, you know I lived in Berkeley for years, so I was very familiar with that area, and she was talking about the road in terms of benevolence, which is an aspect of the Buddha nature. And this is what she said from the Lord of the Tigers. Benevolence is obvious in every single thing, even in things that humans have made, like the road out there, for example. The sun bakes it, the cars go up and down on it, the drunks and dogs do various things on it. We walk on it, and it does the very best job it can of being the road. Sometimes the strain is so great that it cracks, and then we have to be very benevolent to it and mend it. Everything is doing the very best that it can at all times to help us find the unborn. And that is what makes it evolve the universe. She's talking about the other one as a law of the universe. So keep that well in mind. The road that you travel on is one of the finest bodhisattvas you've got. It is just being itself, the very finest road. Don't swear about its potholes. Get out there and mend them. If all, of you, if all that you see of the road is its potholes, you will never see its bodhisattva good, and you will never understand this law of the universe. Well, 
you know what you're able to say that and you changed my life. I went out and looked at that road that I walked on, I don't know how many times. It never looked the same to me. This is a practice. There is nothing esoteric here. This is a really down to earth practice that we can do with regard to those things that we find around us. I'm going to share another one of my favorite stories with you. This one is from, uh, actually it's from this book, book um, in an article that Norman Fisher, who was a former abbot of San Sarah in San Francisco, uh, was a contributor to this book. And, um, and he tells this story. This is another graphic description of how this um, how the unfolding of seeing the Buddha nature works. Once the 20th century Japanese Zen master, Nakagawa Soen Roshi, gave a retreat in America. The retreat took place in a rented school building, so there wasn't much kitchenware available for serving meals. The daily schedule included a tea service. And since there were no teacups, paper cups had to be used. On the first day of the retreat, after the initial serving of tea, the retreatants began to wad their cups up to throw them away. But the Roshi stopped them and said, no, he scolded, we need to use these, these same cups each day, so you have to save them. For seven days, the retreatants used the same paper cups for tea. When the retreat was over, <coughs> so she said, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> okay, now we can throw away the paper cups. But the students wouldn't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> they said, throw them away. These are our cups. We use mindfully every day. How could we possibly throw them away? They're precious to us. <laughs> this happened in a week. <coughs> you know, it just it just brings joy to my heart when I go into the bathroom across the way and see everybody's paper cups that you all have saved for drinking and you all have your names on them. So, you so. so this is a wonderful practice. You know, the thing about it is really that we are the ones that have to make the first gesture. We're the ones that have to do the work. It isn't that, that, that the, world, the world offers itself to us. <clears throat> if there is something in the way of our being able to see that, then we have to work with that. And that is what we are doing in our practice. So Norman Fisher talks a bit more about this teaching uh, in his description of the kitchen uh, at Zen Center. You, you will recognize many things that are familiar, of course, if you've worked in the kitchen here. I always think that it's, it's really helpful to read different descriptions of the same practices <clears throat> because sometimes things that we kind of take for granted are seen more clearly uh, from a slightly different point of view or in someone else's terminology. So, um, Norman Fisher is talking about the, uh, the fact that, of course, that the way that the kitchen is run at Sensor is based on Dovey's instructions to the chief cook, which we have talked about many times in the study um, over the years. And he says, Soda Zen temples both in America and Japan are especially devoted to kitchen work. Monks carefully wash, chop, and combine. Ingredients clean pots and pans, mop floors, serve meals. With dignity and beauty, workers in Zen kitchens are instructed to approach their tasks 
however menial or repetitive, with full religious attention, giving themselves fully to what they are doing. Kitchen practice is a revered undertaking with detailed procedures for the mindful care of food and tools. In our center, for instance, there's a knife practice. Knives are always washed immediately after use rather than being placed in a sink for washing later uh, if someone might be cut. There's also a counter-cleaning practice, wiping down with vinegar at the end of each work period. A cutting board practice, different boards carefully stacked in different locations for fruit, onions, and other foods. And a chopping practice, specific ways of holding the knife and food to be cut for various styles of chop. All these teach the practitioner that the manner in which something is accomplished is proper dharma, as well as the way in which the cleaning up is done is just as much part of the word practice, if not more, as the result. Being present with and respectful of all material things as if each, as if each and every one of them were a sacred object is a primary practice and a primary value. The head monk in a monastic training term not only gives lectures and meets privately with students, but is also in charge of taking out the garbage and cleaning the toilets. These traditional assignments have seen up as holy tasks to be undertaken with full respect and honor. For students in training, the sight of the head monk diligently carrying garbage pails and wielding a toilet brush with full attention is as much a part of his or her teaching as the words uttered in the Dharma Hall. So with this practice, the world becomes alive and is vibrant and everything has great value. Our scripture, our holy scripture, says the wooden figure sustains and the stone baby dances. And um, We don't, we don't need anything extra. We don't need to bring anything in. Um, this, uh, this impulse to bring something in, I think, is described in a very interesting way. Um, the phrase bringing something in is, is actually Dogen's phrase. And um, in this chapter on uh, the uh, precept about intoxicants, Rev. Anderson says, you need to understand the imp how the impulse to change your state arises. This impulse to modify and manipulate and thus diffuse your precious life comes from turning away what Dogen calls the great brightness of your being. He says the essential issue here is that we are dissatisfied with our current experience. We may, dis we may dislike or feel bored with our experience and want to bring in something to modify it a little. Or we may enjoy our experience and want to bring in something to prolong it or intensify it, uh, because um, we are afraid that, um, that we will lose it. All of these examples share a common thread of a lack of appreciation for our own lives and what we have. And um, I would like to just end with this lovely quote by Dogen, which he says, where nothing can be brought in, everything is inviolable. This is exactly the great breakfast.